Thank you. Okay, just just so everybody knows, we we asked Mr. Palladini to come in and, and go over some of our laws and discriminatory and what isn't discriminatory and and try to give you know some education to the community on what the whole deal is here in Prescott, what we're what we're what we're looking at, and hopefully to clarify some of uh, the questions that. Um, that are going on in the community, and you know, I, I read the newspaper blogs, which I've been told I shouldn't, but I do. And I think it's uh, I think it's important to know that you know you may not hear exactly what you want to hear. Uh, we're not going to be out there bashing a community or discriminatory against a class of people. Um, you know, you may be unhappy about that, but that's that's a law, and this city's going to follow the law. And uh, that's that was the reason. Next time, I think we'll we'll do this again, but maybe we'll have a little smaller uh, nice content on it, so it doesn't burn up as much time. So uh, with that, we'll go ahead and move on to um, the old business. Um, there was a question, and I believe Mike Fleming's going to come up. With the um, by the way, when I go to old business, we did have some questions last time. One was from a person named Margaret. Uh, what was the uh, uh, the uh, specific definition of a recovery home? We've printed that in the back, so you're more than welcome to take one of those. If you do have a question, there's some uh, material in the back that you know. Hopefully, we're answering the questions. That that's what we're set out to do: to answer questions and get back. If we don't have the answer for you now, we certainly want to make sure you have the answer by the next meeting. So, with that, we'll go with. Uh, there was a question on tax. And uh, Mr. Fleming, if you would, please. Thank you, sir. Good evening. Um, my name is Michael Fleming. I'm the Chief Co-Compliance Officer with the City of Prescott. And last meeting, uh, a person got up and said uh, they believe that a lot of the group homes in our town are not paying their uh, rental tax to the Yellow County. And so I looked into that and found out from the County Assessor's Office, and more specifically from her assistant, Asha Dugan, that Yellow Pie County does not assess residential property taxes on rental properties. Hmm. What Yellow Pie County does is collect property taxes on, a, on residents on property, and if it's a primary residence where you live, they give you a $600 tax credit. But there is no tax assessed for a residential rental. The city of Prescott, however, does charge for a residential rental. Hmm. And that's part of, I think, even what George was saying before and what John Paladin says, that if we find out a home is being used as a rental property, be it a community residence or by a group of college students, that's one of the things we check through our tax and licensing is to see if they are paying the appropriate tax. So, and what happens then is that the city assesses the tax, it's collected through the city and state, and then the county gets notice of that, that that property now is no longer a primary residence. It might be a secondary residence or rental, and then that property would lose its tax credit. But there is no actual tax assessed by Yellow Pike County. And then there um, also, um, there was another cust or customer, I'm going back to my working day, sorry. <laughs> another person came up and asked about, uh, made a comment about her street being several sober homes and recovery homes opening up on her street. I believe you went out and checked into that as well. I don't have that name. I want to say it was Margaret, but I'm not sure. Uh, the, re the most recent one I had was a, a person complaining about several homes on a street. Um, gosh, I can't remember the street now. Country Park. Mm -hmm. And um, three of the homes they gave me were pretty much all in line. And each one was actual single family residential with the people living on the property. So, and, and that was talking to the individual owners of the property, you know, and also doing the assessment of, uh, you know, what I look for kind of traffic, vehicles, trash. And, and I didn't see any of that stuff that would, you know, that would lead me to indicate that that was used for anything other than single family residential. But when we do get those complaints, you know, I always tell people, give me an address, we'll go out, we'll look at it, we'll make an assessment, and then we go from there. Perfect. I, I'm not sure I got the answer to the tax thing. I, I understood what you said about the county and the city. Uh, the city does charge. Are these places paying the city? 
the ones that we are aware of, yes, they're, they, they're being assessed. Um, even when I go out to a house and I find a bunch of college kids and it's not a group home, <laughs> yeah, we just check to make sure that that's also being as a residential rental as well. But the group homes are paying the tax. Yes, so that, that we're aware of, yes. Question. Okay, thank you. Henry, so Fleming, how many, uh, how many complaints do you respond to a month? You know, it depends upon the season, the time of year. As we get warmer, I get more nuisance, property nuisance complaints. Uh, generally, right now, 20 to 40 a month. You have a backlog? Oh, yeah, I got a, a to, to do pile, I call it. <laughs> yeah. How big of a backlog? Right now, I've probably got about six or seven cases that are sitting that I haven't looked at yet, complaints that I haven't investigated yet. Thank you. I misspoke her name with Nancy. I apologize. Nancy's in the crowd. In the crowd. Hopefully that answered her question as well. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Buddy. We're going to move on to uh, exit strategies. We have some presentations from uh, some uh, people from NARA and ASRA and Silverway. Uh, but before we do that, I'd like to call on Mary Beth Hearn. And if she could come up and uh, speak to uh, an issue that we had last week, or I'm sorry, last month, uh, two gentlemen were living in a sober home that were removed out of that sober home, and we met up with them, and we took some statements, and we'd like to read those statements at this time, and then uh, go through the exit strategy. All right, Matt, thank you. Thank you. Um, for those who don't know me, my name is Mary Beth Wren. Um, I'm here to speak on behalf of Vincent Rienzi and Christopher Watson. They're both from New York. Um, Vincent was, um, his admission date was 1-23-16. I'm going to read a statement. I was in treatment at Promises Recovery in Prescott, Arizona for 64 days. I was told to pack my belongings and leave the property out of nowhere. There was no warning given or an opportunity to make a plan. I was told I had an hour to leave the property on 3-28-16. When I asked what it is the reason I'm being told to leave, I was told I'm just not dealing with you anymore. Also, there was no offer to assist us in getting into another treatment center or even a ride offer. I was expected to just take all my luggage and walk down the street. Luckily, I was able to get a close friend from back home in New York to pay for a room at Motel 6. I did not have the means to do so, or I would have been sleeping in the park or anywhere I could find some kind of shelter until I could get back a flight to New York. And he signed his name and left his phone number. This is from Christopher Watson from Suffolk County, New York. I stayed in housing for 69 days at Promises Recovery. I was told to leave on 3-28-16. The reason for me to be asked to leave was I did not follow the rules such as a girl ban or job search. I was told to pack and leave property with no prior warning and no plans. They told me to figure it out. I was expected to walk off the grounds with all my belongings and three bags in total. I had nowhere to turn. My family is across country, so there's not much they can do. If it wasn't for a close friend who put me up in a motel with him, I would be sleeping on the streets. I've been stressing on where I would go to rest my head until I figured out a flight home. I was out of housing for over six days before I caught my flight home. Christopher Watson, you signed it. Um, the reason I was contacted on this is um, I am uh, Representative Campbell's liaison to his um, sober living bill, 2107. And also, for those who don't know me, I would never just take anybody's word for this. I corroborated the evidence on this, and I was contacted by the voice therapist. He was absolutely afraid for their safety. And he contacted me because he knows they have contacts with a lot of uh, members in the recovery home industry. And he was hoping that I would find them a place to stay. So after a day, I was able to make contact with them. And they were not interested in going back to another home. They really just wanted to return home to New York. Um, the therapist also verified that they were let go for no reason that what's going on now is health net insurance is stopping paying insurance claims for all the recovery homes up here. And this has been going on since December. 
So we have kids that are literally just let out on the streets, and this is really becoming a dangerous situation. Robert Isaac Candle has talked to the CEO of HealthNet as of today. I'm going to get to the bottom of it. But I understand that neighbors have huge problems, and, and I get it, but this is the other fallout of this. And um, Mr. Martin met with these kids with me and it, as we took the statements. Um, these were good kids. They weren't using. And what could have happened for the six and seven days that they literally walked our streets, they could have been shoplifting, they could have been using. But they weren't. But the other kids that, that weren't so tight in their recovery, that's what happens. They do do that. They wreak havoc on our neighborhoods. Um, so I'm hoping that you can investigate this. And with that, I'd be happy to take any other questions. Ms. Wren, how are you? Just well. Great. Um, you've got a big background in this, and I know you've been very instrumental with the uh, bill, which we're hoping is not that far away from being signed. Um, what is your perception of, in general, the facility owners or the, the operators of the facilities? Uh, I've often wondered, would they be willing to meet us as a committee and discuss with them personally, cut out the middleman, let them, I'm sure they're aware of all these stories, but have the ones that you've spoken to, you know, in the process of the bill and, and uh, you know, getting some suggestions from them, have they been open-minded to uh, instituting an exit strategy for every single one that they attract into this city? Here's what I've found. I have found that um, the very same uh, owner CEOs that have been willing to sit down with me from the beginning, well at least last year at this time, the first year that Representative Campbell tried his bill, um, there was no one willing to actually come forward and, and support it. No one in the industry. We worked very hard after the first year. And I think we've built up some very good rapport within the industry. And I think everyone here has to understand the industry and the neighborhoods really won't clean up until we get this cooperation with the recovery homes. And I think the homes that show up here, they are the ones that are willing to help. So as far as bashing the people that show up, you're not really going to get anywhere because they are the ones that are willing to step forward. So. What I found are that there are ones that absolutely have sat down from the beginning. Um, and there's a gentleman here that's Peter Thomas, who's actually sat down, helped draft part of the legislation, and several other homeowner, um, owners that have done that. And there's also ones that I won't name that have never come forward. Um, I think these people know who I am and what I've done and tried to work with the people and the uh, residents with Representative Campbell and the owners, and they've never contacted me. So I think it speaks volumes for the kind of operation that they say they have. But the ones that have been um, kind of forward thinking, have they? do they understand the need for an exit strategy? What's your opinion on that? Uh, the, the good ones already have it in place. They do have one in place? Yes, they do. OK. That's great. Thank you very much. Okay. Could you give us an example of, of what the strategy includes, the exit strategies that are in place? Some of them already have it in admission. They actually have something in, in their contract that says um, that they will actually take them to the airport and things like that. I know one, one home that does things like that. So I mean, again, this is America. We have a constitution. We can't force people to leave. But um, they can. It's kind of known that you, know, you won't stay in Prescott. And that you'll have a way home if you need a way home. Yes, then they actually will um, take the kid on their own um, down to Sky Harbor, things like that, if they know if they don't live in the state. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Anyone else? Okay. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Mayor Beth. Oh, yeah, I'll give this to you. Oh, thank you. I wanted to start off with that. If we could get uh, our representative from NARA up and speak to their exit strategy. I think that's a, uh, been hearing a lot, of, a lot of words in the community and talking to several folks about the exit strategies. And uh, again, these are the people who do have the strategies in place and they just want to share with the community what they do to prevent 
what happened to Vincent and, and Christopher. Thank you. Is Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Did you want copies of this made for the committee or did you just want me to hand this down? If you're able to make copies, that'd be great. I didn't bring enough for everybody to look at. I have a, a sample of Chapter 5's discharge policy. Okay. Um, there's one copy going around and I've got one to look off of. I didn't prepare a formal presentation tonight. I'd be happy to answer questions though. Uh, I start, I can't speak in detail about the individual NARA members' policies. I can say that NARA as an organization has a mandate that our members have exit policies in place and that they'd be able to address discharges for their clients. Uh, we were originally affiliated with ASRA, which is the state organization, which is also here tonight. And most of our policies are based off of ASRA language. Uh, while the, the new chief is making copies, are there any questions about Chapter 5's policies or um, policies throughout the industry? Well, if, if you could just let us, briefly let us know what the policy is, that would be, you know, if somebody wants to exit the program or, or wants to go home or, uh, I guess, in, in Vincent's case, and Christopher's case, you know, there was nothing in place prior to them being asked to leave. Is that is that commonplace within the industry, or is there is there programs that you know follow? I would say that that is fairly commonplace throughout the industry, and that's not localized in Prescott or even in Arizona. That's an old mentality and addiction, and it's it's seen in all areas. The tough love mentality: if you're not ready, get out. Um, families have been taught to, to demonstrate that through Al-Anon and, and similar programs. And so it's been a hard shift away from that mentality. Um, Chapter 5's policies probably don't mirror most in the community. I know that there are many organizations in town that have come to us asking for assistance in drafting their own. Chapter 5 has very stringent policies on what we do when we discharge a client. And there are a few different types of discharges that we deal with. Um, we, we generalize them as graduations where somebody comes in, they do our full program, and they complete. And at that point, they're able to go out and, and get their own residence uh, and live a pretty normal life, whether that's in the community or they go back to where they came from. And then there are atypical discharges, and that includes somebody leaving against staff advice or against medical advice. Generally, in those scenarios, we don't have any control over what the, the client does. They are adults. Um, most of the providers in town work with adults only, and if somebody chooses to leave and they don't want help going somewhere else or help going back where they're from, there's nothing that we can do to force them. There are also staff-initiated discharges, which are for repeated relapse or for major behavioral concerns within the house, safety concerns, concerns arising from somebody not being an appropriate fit for our level of service. We're not able to treat them effectively. In those cases, we have a very stringent policy in place, which is what's being copied right now. Um, and I'll read just briefly. Uh, chapter 5's process for addressing continuity of care after your transfer or discharge is as follows. Chapter 5 maintains responsibility of care for the client until 1. Client has entered services at another provider, or 2. Client refuses assistance with transfer to another provider. So. Chapter 5 believes that we are responsible for the client's well-being until they are in another place. Um, we are not able to buy them a ticket back to a, a residence out of state. That would be inducement. Um, we are luring them to Chapter 5 for services which we can bill for and providing service to them. But we can make sure that their family or the client themselves is able to make those travel arrangements. Our, our main goal when we have an atypical discharge is to transfer them to another provider that's going to be able to address their needs specifically. And we try to discharge people out of the Prescott area to providers that have a higher level of licensure, higher level of expertise, they're gonna be able to give good treatment and not keep people stuck in, in what's become kind of a revolving door of treatment. Did that answer some of your question? Just to clarify, Again, why can't you charge somebody the flight fee in yes. part of, as part of the introduction to your program? There, there was a reason for that? We're not able to purchase travel uh, flights or buses for a client either coming into our program or leaving our program because it would be considered an inducement. We are offering them something of value 
for them to come to our program where we're able to bill their insurance. May I ask, what define inducement for me? Inducement could be any number of different things, but it's, it's where we provide something of value in order to bill their insurance. So we could say, we will give you $100 a week in food if you come to Chapter 5, or we will buy your ticket to Chapter 5 um, if we're able to bill your insurance for it, or, or any number of things, waiving housing fees, um, waiving co-pays and deductibles, anything that's of a financial value that we are giving them in return for the ability to bill their insurance for medical services. So that was a, a rule set up by the insurance companies? Um, that's that's a uh, Medicare rule and it's a rule that's Medicare. stated in the individual policies for insurance. Okay. Are all of the clients um, paid for by insurance companies or or could they also have to provide their own ticket in case of exit? They could be required to provide their own ticket. Setting a specific date would be very challenging, whether a client comes in and completes the program as prescribed, or they come in and they struggle and their stay is either lengthened or they do really well and it's reduced. It's hard to say six months out on this day you can fly back, or... No, 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 but what I was thinking is like, you know, that portion could just be put aside and be there if in case it needed to be used, and when they graduated the program, it could be given back, but it wouldn't be you giving them the money, it would be them putting the money there in case as part of the exit plan, or is the whole treatment always paid 100% by insurance? It, it's not generally paid 100% by insurance, and that is something that could be done as long as the family is able to put that money down and it could be held for them, yeah. So that is a possibility? It is. Mr. Palladini, would it be possible to include in our ordinance a um, defined exit plan, uh, which the sober living homes would then have to uh, comply with, and therefore they wouldn't be providing an inducement, they would be complying with regulation within the city? Well, under our, under our current authority, under our current zoning plan, the answer would be no. Um, if, the no if the no camel bill gets back, if the house hears it again, if it gets approved, the change gets approved, goes back, they don't get signed, takes effect. Part of that, or part of the, the primary part of that bill, would allow for us to adopt sort of operational regulations, not, not zoning, but more health and, health and safety type regulations. Certainly an exit plan <coughs> is, is contemplated as one of those operational type regulations. But as far as sort of what goes in the, what we're required to go in the exit plan, that's sort of drilled down, it's sort of premature to get into that right now. It, so but conceptually it's possible. It, it, it's conceptually possible. Um, but again, I, I can see without going into too much detail, a lot of, a lot of holes in, in having money set aside and what's it used for, can it be used for tickets, can, do you have to give the person cash or do you have to use it for something other than travel and so, I, you know, it would be hard to, hard to regulate too. Once we, if we adopted something like that, how do we then enforce it? That's always a concern. What's your opinion on that, Mr. Thomas? I struggle to answer that. I, I think that any way that we can ensure that people are able to get out of the community if they go to the street is, is a benefit. And that's not just to the community, it's also to the client and the treatment centers. Um, going back to a question that Mary Beth fielded, the, the quality providers see the problem just as much as the community does. And, and we've been pushing to try and bring this to a, um, a solution that can actually be enacted. It's, it's not a simple problem, and I think that the more we delve into it, the more everybody has realized the complexities of it. There's a lot of nuances. And with exit plans, I think that rather than setting a, an across-the-board solution, we need to look at what is clinically in the best interest of the patient. They're coming here for medical service. We need to be offering them that medical service. And when we're discharging them, for whatever reason, we need to give them the benefit of making that decision on clinical grounds rather than community concerns. <coughs> <clears throat> May I? Mr. Thomas, can I just ask you, uh, <clears throat> in your facility alone, what percentage of uh, clients fail out of the program and stay? Stay in the community? Yeah, and, and it, uh, that's another part of that question. 
If you have a problem client that you know could be a, uh, a nuisance to the community or dangerous, do you have a duty to report that to the police department if they leave your facility and you don't know where they go? Yes, if a client is a danger to themselves or anybody else or to the community, we have a duty to report. Okay. If a client just relapses and they're not a direct danger to themselves or somebody else, we are bound by confidentiality not to report that unless it's somebody who's at Chapter 5 through probation, in which case we have a release on file. I think that that's another area that needs to be addressed either through this committee or the city council or at the state level is how the providers are able to access some of those services. I, I don't want to cast any stones at the police or at emergency medical services, but it is a challenge when we have clients that really need that kind of an intervention, either police or EMS, to get them there to respond effectively. Um, and for Chapter 5, that would be if a client reports suicidal ideation, if a client becomes violent, if a really risk to self or risk to others that's reported but not physically acted out. Our, our hands are pretty limited, or we are pretty limited in what we can do and the resources that we can get from the city or the hospital to, to help those people get the services that they need. What about the percentage? I'm sorry. Oh, what yeah. about the percentage? I'm sorry. Um, Last question. The Chapter 5, we see about 25% of people come in, go through the whole program and complete in one round. Um, we don't have long-term outcome studies. Those of you who were at the film festival a couple weeks ago know that that's something that's not in place and it's a, a real challenge to get good quality outcome studies. But about 25% of people come in and graduate the program without issue. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Appreciate that. Hazra? Hi. Mm -hmm. Hi, how are you? Good, how are you? Good. I'm Susan Padilla. Could you and speak louder, please? I'm Louie. Uh, Here you go. Okay. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, my name is Susan Padilla, and I was asked to speak for Ezra um, because the board member was not able to make it today. I was absolutely not prepared with an exit strategy um, presentation. Right now, uh, I did talk to Will from Ezra about it. And right now, Ezra does not have that part of their policies and procedures requirements for their members, but said that um, they will um, incorporate all of House Bill 2107 into their requirements. They're no longer opposing the bill um, and want to comply 100%. I. Um, I have a house here in Prescott, and I network with some other houses in Prescott. Um, we've asked permission from ASRA to start our own Northern Committee, and to actually not just go by the bar that they have, but to actually raise that bar even higher, have our own Northern Committee, try to get as many members as we can to join um, ASRA so that we can self-govern better. Hopefully to be able to work with the city if we can find these houses try to get them to join, come alongside, try to lift them up, kind of try to sift between the good and the bad. And um, the other house owners that I know would like to work with the city and see if we could do something to take care of the problem. We really want to be part of the solution. Perfect, and that's, that's why we're here, to be part of the solution. Questions? How many members do you have uh, in the Prescott area? Right now, we only have about four or five. I need. I went to the city to get a list of um, the registered homes. Most of them are treatment. Uh, Ezra is more geared toward the sober living homes. Although treatment's good too, but they don't seem to be the bigger issue on the problem right now. So you're aggressively trying to contact the known homes and uh, solicit them to join Ezra? Right. How long has that process been going on? Um, well, we started it and then we kind of stopped it. Um, the house is here, kind of waiting on to see what happens with 2107 because those of us here that are in Ezra um, wanted to see the bill go through. At that time, um, Ezra was opposing the bill. And so we kind of sat on the fence. 
So after I found out the other day that Azra is no longer opposing, I got a hold of my networking people, and um, we want to jump on it right away. Well, good luck with that, and uh, come back and let us know how it proceeds. Okay. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And uh, Silverway? Do we have anybody from Silverway here? Not okay. Okay, we'll move along. We have uh, new business on the commercial vehicle CDL. We had a uh, call in or a written uh, statement of the citizen questioning about the white vans driving around town. Are they uh, required? to have commercial license, a uh, commercial driver, and I uh, believe. Well, thank you, Chairman. Yes, sir. Um, so because of that question being raised um, last month, um, this month we brought our traffic safety section uh, supervisor, Sergeant Brian Deaver, in to answer that question and any other questions you might have. Thank you. Good evening. Welcome, Sergeant. Thank you. Uh, that question was this brought forth, basically it's a commercial vehicle question. Uh, bottom line is no, they're not required. There's nothing special for that. The reason is, is several. Uh, there's state level laws and there's federal level laws. Basically, federal level laws is what governs commercial vehicles. Um, the Commercial Vehicle Act, the Commercial Vehicle Safety Act was enacted back in 1986. The federal guidelines that basically outlines everything at a minimal level. What that means is every state has their own stipulations and guidelines they can follow, but they have to come to that standard minimum of that safety act. So that just basically says you can't do anything less, you can do more if you want type of a deal. So for the commercial vehicle, a couple things that has to fall for them in order to have that license. Mainly for them, it's going to fall under the capacity of the vehicle that they are operating. For you to have a commercial driver's license for a commercial vehicle itself for passenger purposes, it basically has to be designed for 15, more than 15, so actually 16. If you look at all these vans, the three quarter ton and the one ton vans, they're basically a 14 passenger van, which includes the driver. Some of them you can say 15, but the design themselves does not qualify for them to necessitate that they have a CDL when operating that vehicle. If it's more than 16 or 16 or more, then yes, they would have to have a commercial driver's license. There's also some litigation or some stipulation on the, the gross vehicle weight, meaning how much that vehicle weighs plus its towing capacity and hauling. Uh, basically 26,001 26, pounds, so more than 26,000 pounds is what it requires for you to have a CDL in operating one of those vehicles. A three quarter ton van, uh, 6,700 to 8,000, a uh, one ton, 75 to 8,500 gross vehicle weight. So they're well under the, the needed uh, weight, gross vehicle weight in order to need a CDL to do that. In regards to commercial vehicle licensing, I uh, did a little research, talked with some different people, talked with, I, again, in discussion with our city prosecutor, make sure we're all on the same page with it. I've talked with people with uh, ADOT, MVD, to confirm, I talked with somebody uh, just recently, ADOT down in Phoenix, because it's been brought to their attention too as a state level issue and other, not just Prescott dealing with it, but down in the valley, how they deal with it. It, it wouldn't fall under a commercial vehicle. There's a couple different stipulations that it would. For example, if those drivers are taking payment per drive, like a taxi cab, then yes, it would have to be as a register as a commercial vehicle. That's not the case with these vehicles as far as we know. And even if it's written into a contract, you know, uh, transportation will be provided as part of their contract. Uh, can con confirm that that still would not fall as a commercial vehicle for the furtherance of uh, commercial enterprise, basically. So at the end of the day, there is no further stipulations. There's no guidelines that prevent them from operating a passenger van other than if it holds more than 16 people or if the gross vehicle weight is 26 plus that, uh, pound, thousand pounds on that vehicle. I have a question, Dan. Yes. Mm -hmm. So I know a CDL has other stipulations besides the size of the vehicle. Um, drug testing, you get a ticket, you lose your CDL. These kinds of things happen. And with the vans, have there been an inordinate number of accidents, or is there any testing for the drivers to make sure that they're not using? Because aren't they oftentimes somebody in the home? 
If they fall under, if they're required as a CDL holder, yes, there's federal guidelines, there's medical cards, there's different uh, testing they have to do, but since they don't fall, they're not qualified. That, but that was my question. Since they don't have to have that component of it, is there anything else? Are they tested? Are they, they're usually people who are in the home, correct? I, I don't have an answer. That would be something for the home themselves. For us, it would be a case-by-case -case basis as we treat with anybody. Any accident that we come upon, um, our officers are trained. We have signs and symptoms that we look for for impairment or something that would lead that officer to believe that might they would be tested individually if it's appropriate. Have there been a lot of van accidents? Or? Uh, not. I don't have a, a spec sheet or how many we've had. To my knowledge, we investigate. Uh, there, there's probably some, but not not a whole lot that I know of off the top of my head. Yeah, I, I also don't believe that there's like a large percentage of van involved accidents as compared to regular accidents that we investigate. Correct. I mean, there's not, not that we have to say, hey, this is on our radar. We try to keep a watch on certain areas of town. Obviously, we have hot spots that get certain locations. Um, if there's something that's brought to our attention and as a traffic safety supervisor that's not been brought to my attention that says hey we have a lot of van uh, attributed to that so. thank you and just to take your conversation one step further when you were talking about is there mandatory drug testing by these drivers um, there's nothing in state statute that requires any type of testing because they don't fall under that commercial vehicle or that commercial driver's license needs now some of these um, homes that do have these vans now whether they have been a contract on who's driving it whether or not you know they're drug tested or what their restrictions are would be on a case-by-case -case basis because they must have to insure the van and the driver and all of that right okay. just, yeah, they, I just wanted the information yeah they mean they would basically fall on the same guidelines as you or i you know if you got a driver's license insurance registration all that applies to them just like anybody else it would but they're driving for the home, so the home must have to carry the Somebody is required per law to have red insurance on that vehicle, yes. Other questions? Thank you, Sergeant. Okay, we're going to, we don't have much time left, but what time we do, we're going to open it up to public comments. Um, I'd like to remind everybody that uh, we do have the uh, gatekeeper over here. Phil's going to try to keep us within the five minute line so that we can get as many comments as we can. We only have 15 minutes left, but uh, uh, you know, you certainly don't need to take all five minutes. Please don't. We want to try to get as many people up here as possible. And uh, we will give you a 30 second warning if uh, it goes on too long. And another thing I'd like to remind again, you know, we've had a lot of talk tonight about discrimination and, and, and what's acceptable and what's not acceptable. And, and, you know, when you come up and make your comments, if you, you know, we're really looking for uh, uh, subjects, subjective type comments where you have dates, addresses, times, you know, uh, a description of people. Uh, if you have a complaint or if you have a something that you just want to state, you're more than welcome to do so. But uh, again, we're going to ask to go within the guidelines that uh, we have learned tonight. So with that, if uh, anybody does have a comment, come on up, uh, state your name, where you live, and we'll certainly try to give the answer to you. Uh, the uh, mayor has given us some great resources. We have a city attorney, we have uh, uh, zoning, we have uh, 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 Deputy Chief Reinhardt here. Uh, hopefully we can get your answer tonight, and if we can't get your answer tonight, we will get your answer the next meeting. So please come on up forward. Hi, my name is Steve Lundgren. I live on South Washington. I've uh, been a resident for about two and a half years, bought a house here about five years ago, the intention of moving here full time. So it took us about two and a half years to do that. I moved here uh, because of the, uh, the culture, the history, uh, the community, uh, the climate, for, uh, you know, for all the reasons why, uh, why most, most of us like to live here. When I bought the house, I realized that there was an apartment house on the right-hand side, which we'd never had a problem with, and a rental house on the left-hand side. I was led to believe by the owner that it was uh, mostly college students. And so for the first uh, six months to a year, we had no uh, real issues other than the place is a mess uh, most of the time. 
uh, where my wife and I are picking up the garbage out of the street, uh, taking the trash cans back. But I would say in the last uh, year and a half to two years, uh, about a year, last year, year and a half, uh, we've noticed that the residents are uh, much more transient. That I would say that uh, every three to four months, there seems to be almost a wholesale change of, uh, of who they were. And then in the last six months, uh, at least with, uh, uh, and especially this group of kids, so let me back up, live and let live. You know, we're looking at, uh, I was a college kid once, uh, uh, known to make a little bit of noise and stuff, uh, as long as it didn't get out of hand, uh, we're just, just uh, that's fine. You know, uh, that's the way it is. We knew what, we, uh, what the condition of the property was when we bought it, we accepted that. Uh, but it's it, it's gotten critical now. Uh, the uh, the um, uh, it, our, we do live next to the house where uh, last week, uh, ten days ago, uh, come home. There's uh, three police cars, uh, one fire engine, uh, one EMS vehicle. Uh, there's uh, I can look. At our, my house is higher than that, just by a few feet, so I can look over the bushes and see what's going on. Uh, there seemed to be some civil conversations, and it was uh, escalated by one of the residents, uh, and to, to the point where that young man was arrested. Uh, there, uh, then someone was taken out of the house on a gurney, and this was this was going on for a period of about an hour and a, and a half. Uh, leading up to this, there's been increasing noise. Uh, there has been uh, late at night uh, cursing with multiple. Uh, F-bombs, uh, GD bombs, S-bombs, uh, and then uh, on the day that this happened the next day, I talked to two of the young men that, that I'd seen uh, in there asking them to uh, clean it up. I was young once, not really realizing everything that was going on, uh, but then the more I think, the more I think about it, and uh, I learned a lot tonight. So, so uh, not, to, not to disparage those groups that are too, trying to do it well, uh, but we certainly have a problem that those are not doing it well. The uh, uh, the a question that I have on the uh, the the licensing, if there's been a wholesale, uh, you know, um, proof that they have been using drugs and they are not registered, then what recourses do we have uh, to make sure that that uh, this place? is identified as not just college students, uh, but other things. And, and, and to note, two days later, uh, they're drinking beer on the sidewalk, and one of them is smoking, a pot, is smoking a joint. So you could say, why don't you say something? Well, uh, from, from what I heard Mr. Thomas say, one of the, one of the things that they have uh, issues with is when someone is violent, or someone is going to do self-harm, and the police department is busy, or uh, they seem to have some concerns about the response to the police office, put yourself in my place. So at 11.30 or 12.30 at night, I'm gonna go tell them to be quiet when I don't know what they've been doing and what kind of reaction. Well, I will protect myself, and then what kind of trouble am I gonna be in? So there certainly is, uh, I, and I don't, in, in, with the respect of the woman that came up and spoke about the two people, I'm, I'm all, all for, uh, these people getting help, uh, living in the community after they're done, being gainfully employed, uh, contributing in a positive way, I have no, no problem with that. Uh, I have a problem with the owner of my property next door currently, mm -hmm. as you can imagine after hearing uh, what I heard. Uh, one other uh, quick personal experience, we rented the house for two and a half years before we moved here. Uh, we had three uh, people renting there uh, over that two and a half years. Uh, one of the uh, tenants that we had, uh, we agreed a single woman. We started getting checks for payment from one of the houses, not from the individual. Okay, and then, uh, so this is deceptive practice, uh, so then we were threatened with suit for not having air conditioning, uh, which our uh, lease agreement clearly stated it. They, they started uh, to sue us, wanted to sue us for uh, all the rent uh, plus damages. Uh, I said, I'll see you in court. Uh, no. Mm -hmm. uh, the, and then we realized that there were two additional people living in our home that entire time. So we got that. Leased it to a woman. Payments by one of the houses. Two additional people living in our home. And I wonder how many other people 
have experienced that type of thing. So deceptive practices. My time is up. Thank you. And by the way, thank you all for uh, being on this committee. Uh, uh, I admire you. Thank, thank you. you, Steve. Thank you for your comments. Uh, Mr. Palladini, if you could address. Sure. I, I think the, the, <clears throat> the simple answer to the neighbor question is our disruptive properties ordinance, which was adopted by the council maybe a month or a little over a month ago. In effect now, uh, it's a tool that the police department have for sort of ongoing nuisance type activities that don't arise to, you know, when somebody commits a crime, police department shows up, that person's arrested, does, you know, but specific crimes, you know, result in specific arrests, but sort of the ongoing nuisance or disruptive property ordinance, I think is a good tool for people to use to call the police department. And we have a, we have a mechanism now where we can tamper down those kinds of activities, whether it's a group of college students, a group of people living together and, and who are in college and just working, or if it's a community residence, I mean, it, it applies across the board, or people who own the house are just obnoxious. I mean, there's no, there's no limitation, it doesn't have to be just renters. So just for clarification, now Steve's made the complaint at this meeting, so do, does he need to contact anybody else, or does he, or can we proceed from this meeting to get him some answers? Um, actually, if you would hang tight after this meeting, I think we're going to be done in about five minutes anyhow. Um, I'd like to talk to you about that, and I'll give him exactly those contacts. So thank you. Thank you, sir. We have time for another. Come on up forward, please. <coughs> <clears throat> I'm, oh, excuse me, I must have lost my voice. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, my name is Terry Alleman. I've been here about 11 years. Um, my family and friends have been active making dinners for, like, the women's shelter. We're currently involved with um, Project, Project Aware. Aware. Project, Project Aware. Aware. <laughs> um, programs that we were led to believe that and we still feel in some cases that they're really doing a lot of good and so we want to help them so as the previous gentleman I don't have any problem with people that are really trying to improve their life and overcome their addictions um, th that's great I do have a problem for people though that are just abusing the system and they're using all of our homes just to have a place to stay why who they do who knows what and are on their um, on drugs and alcohol. Um, what the courier has been putting out these articles, um, they were about different people and they're all success stories, and that's good, you know, it's good, great to hear it, but they're troubling too because of some of the things that came out on their stories. One guy uh, kicked around from one house to another for three years here in Prescott. Three years! We paid for that. And um, that was before he was even trying to do anything about his, prob his problem. And so um, I want to know if we have anything that is in the plans for this program that is to gather statistical data from all these different homes on their operations, on their management, on the residents, and uh, what those residents are doing while they're there. Are they committing crimes there? Uh, what kind of crimes are they doing? This, that, all of the stuff that can be measured and we can determine which homes are doing the good jobs and which homes are merely passing them on. That, that was my question. So. Perfect. I have one Thank question you. to add to that. Well, come on up. And okay, real quick. Just one question. No, that's fine. Um, Field information reporting, FIR cards. If I was living next door to one of those facilities, I would, wouldn't, would like to know about who these people are and what, what their criminal history is. And therefore, the cards would let you know, well, these people, these particular people living in this place, you would have a card on them. It would go into the computer. If they were arrested or stopped for whatever reason, you would know where they came from. But I've tried to do the statistics getting on sieges and uh, uh, uniform, uh, uniform crime information reporting system, and there is nothing. There are no statistics for Prescott. I went on the FBI system, couldn't. And the only thing you've got is crime mapping. Because I was trying to find how 
uh, uh, where we stand as far as that crime and how it has increased in the years that I've been here. But I'm one of them, I don't want them near my house. And especially if I have kids. I don't. Okay. That's it. Mm -hmm. Them, remember them are people. Mm -hmm. Whatever. Okay. <laughs> Thank I you. I don't care. Thank you. Peter, you got, I, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to real quick switch over to uh, Deputy Chief. I know, we, I know the PD does FI cards. I don't believe those are public though, correct? Mm -hmm. Actually, they would be if somebody wanted to request FI cards. Okay. Um, but some of the information is going to be redacted, obviously, okay. out of those cards. But um, in response to her comments, we actually do track from year to year crime statistics, and so those are available. Good file. Um, Not on the computer. The, if if you would like to come into our records, you know, section the front desk okay. and walk in, uh, we can make those reports available to you. Wow, thank you. You're thank welcome. You. Perfect. Uh, Peter, did you have a question or answer? I, I think that I can answer part of uh, both questions there. With the, the records of where the guests are, what they're doing, their criminal activity, we cannot acknowledge whether a client is at our facility or not under any circumstances without a court order or unless they're a danger to themselves or someone else. They're, they're protected by healthcare privacy, HIPAA laws. Um, with the, the first question about data, Tomorrow, NARA, the Northern Arizona Recovery Association, has a meeting, and we're discussing how our member organizations can come together and start compiling those sorts of pieces of data. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you, Thank you Peter. Again, sometimes you might not have the answer you know, that you want, but at least we're getting you an answer and something that you can, you can refer to. I hope that helps. Okay. We're going to push the envelope. Anybody else? We'll take one more. Going once. I have I have one comment. Yes, ma'am. Early in the meeting, at the very beginning on the handout, it said that this is an acknowledged problem in Arizona. Um, I have a guest in my home who um, told their friend that they were coming here who was interested in property in Prescott. And the first thing the person said was, Would you look at this piece of property and will you find out about that? drug uh, rehab problem that they're having in Prescott. The person lives in Washington State. So this is a problem that is becoming well known far out, far beyond Prescott. And it's a problem that's happening in a lot of places. But I think that we need to acknowledge that we're just one piece of a huge countrywide problem. And they could be any one of our children because this problem has very deep roots. I, I, Thanks for bringing that out, Lauren, because, again, when I talk about uh, the addicts, I mean, these, these kids, uh, the people who are here uh, working on their sobriety, I mean, these are kids from your next door neighbors. Um, uh, the two gentlemen that uh, Mary Beth and I met, I mean, they could very easily be somebody that works in the grocery store or, or waits on your table. Um, you know, they're not the the picture you see of the 60s, if you will. Um, these, are, these are our community uh, kids. And um, personally, you know, I mean, my son was an addict as well. And uh, he was a baseball player and uh, all around a good kid, but he had bad choices. So, um, you know, if you saw him, you would have no idea that that, that, was, a, that, that was a problem in his life. But. Uh, with that, I think nobody else. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, did you want to say? I'll something? address her also at the end. Unless you would like it now. Um, you know, the FBI on their website, they do also keep crime statistics under their UCR tab. It's a little difficult to find, but. I did find it, but. And it shows history from year to year in cities. I did right. see them for, for Arizona, but there were not present. Was I missing something because I didn't see Prescott? Yeah, it, it, it is in there. Oh, it is? Okay. Yeah, and, and I'll, I can walk you through that. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, last comment. Connie, go ahead. Um, I also wanted to say, too, that I think we all have a propensity to blame the addict. Um, actually, in our case here in Prescott, in my opinion, I think the facilities 
bear the, you know, the brunt of a lot of this. I think if there was, again, this House bill that has been passed uh, is going to go a long way to helping this because, you know, when they're attracting uh, patients here by the thousands, they need to have a little bit more responsibility, you know, to the addict when they're charging for a service. So, you know, the addicts come here looking to get clean. Uh, they're being dumped out into the neighborhoods and all the other things we heard about tonight, but really a lot of this has to go back to the facilities attracting the addict here. Thank you. Yeah, I understand that, but I've come from uh, a town in California where totally part of, I would say, that it, it's been destroyed by many, many houses. I'm talking about blocks and blocks of houses. And you're talking about how many, 800 feet? No. Blocks and blocks of houses taken in juvenile uh, recovery. Uh, you've got these sex offenders and all this. Yeah, it's, I know. It's, it's totally terrible. destroyed. Totally. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you again. Thank you, everybody, for attending. Our next meeting will be held on Wednesday, May 11th. In the very chambers we're in tonight. Thank you again to Mr. Paladini, the great, the great uh, uh, explanation of what we had.